I'm Mark Lukashevitz, Dean of the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication at Hofstra University, and I'm honored to be here with Francis Ford Coppola, legendary alumnus of Hofstra University, legendary filmmaker, and legendary winemaker. Uh, welcome. We're so pleased to talk oh, to you thank today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I want to start off by talking about your enormously successful uh, legendary career as a filmmaker. Uh, we're in this strange era now of storytelling, uh, all kinds of things going on in the world. What kind of a message do you have for young filmmakers today, some of the hundreds of students we have at the Herbert School, uh, seeking to follow in your footsteps as great filmmakers? Well, I think every, every young filmmaker has to a little bit sit down and and, and make a decision, and it's not a decision that they ultimately have to stick to no matter what, but I mean, you sort of have to decide really whether you want to be Steven Spielberg or Jarmusch. And, and that, that, both are wonderful filmmakers, and, 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 and obviously not everyone is gonna be able to be a Steven Spielberg, but really, are you doing it to kind of have a career, make a lot of money, and make your parents proud, or are you doing it because you want to do something very personal and it doesn't you know maybe you'll be starving most of your life or struggling but you want to make films that are personal and and uh, unique to you and uh, so so it's a choice of uh, am I going into an industry or am I going to be an artist um, I, it wasn't entirely clear to me when I was 17 18 but I guess uh, I mean to me it was such a, a dream to be to direct a play or to direct a movie. I didn't know what it was, whether I didn't know that there. But I was attracted to some of the very young filmmakers who were already, of course, famous. Orson Welles being number one, John Frankenheimer being number two. These were, these were filmmakers in, in barely 20, 21, 22, so it had a lot of, and they were making personal films. Also, I was raised in a time when there was there were two kinds of cinema. There was Hollywood and an incredible tradition of, uh, of films being made out of, out of the West Coast uh, by studios, or like mass production, but wonderful films, great directors and beautiful actors, actresses, great masterpieces like uh, The Best Years of Our Lives or, or, uh, or Citizen Kane for that matter. And then on the other hand, there were all these films that were showing up in more local, uh, what were strange new art theaters that films by uh, Japanese, Kurosawa and uh, Ozu and Fellini and the new wave. So I was caught between, in a sense, two tides and uh, wanted to do both, I wanted to be both. And in a, in a sense, maybe that's the, the question I'm asking. Do you want to be Stephen or do you want to be uh, Jarmusch, which is almost the difference between what was Hollywood to me and what was the, the European influence, uh, the personal film. And that's what it really comes down to is, are, are you going to be the kind of uh, craftsman who they say, okay, make a movie about Ben Franklin, make a movie about Ben Franklin, make a movie about uh, Madame Curie, make a movie that's like Hollywood. <coughs> or are you gonna take something that is really your life and, and, and on the basis of being an individual uh, person, may be an artist that's going to create something out of your own mm. being. So I think you have to make that a little bit start the decision that you want to go in, because right. it's a different route. It seems to me in the, in the last uh, years of, of your filmmaking, we've seen films that are really intimate, Youth After Youth or Tetro, which are really intimate, personal stories, not they don't have that blockbuster vibe, and yet they really have a, a powerful message. Do you think, still think there's room for that kind of filmmaking? Well, that's all there is now, is the, is the because now for a young person, it's, I mean, you're going to probably be making very inexpensive independent films. <coughs> and, and those can be successful. We saw Barry Jenkins made Moonlight um, every year or so. Uh, there's something discovered at Sundance, uh, Tamara Jenkins, my own daughter, so that the low-budget independent world is where the personal, and, and, and for years the, the, the best films are made. And then the other uh, kind of filmmaking, which are the big you know, blockbusters, they evolve, sometimes the 
independent filmmaker gets the chance to direct one of those, as what happened with Black Panther. <coughs> um, very talented young filmmaker named Ryan, uh, what was his name, Ryan uh, Cougar, Cougar, Cougar uh, uh, who made Fruitful Station, which was a beautiful low-budget film, made this blockbuster. So sometimes that, that works. Mm -hmm. But they're two different worlds, and they're two different paths, and two different kinds of people who want to go right. make the various kinds of sacrifices that you have right. to do to be an artist, right. wh whether you're going to be a, a you know a multi-million-dollar mm -hmm. type of uh, enterprise, or you, right. whether you're going to be struggling right. all your life. Right. It's also fascinating to me that your daughter has done production in film. You've really embraced some new technologies and I have your book which I was reading uh, live cinema which is a fantastic concept of combining live production and some of the skills television uses with filmmaking to create a, a live event can you talk about your vision for that well the the real point of all that is 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 to understand that most of the art that we enjoy today is canned you know, uh, certainly film is pre-recorded and pre-edited and, and pre-worked over. Uh, most television is recorded and edited. Even even live uh, rock events that big stars might do are so heavily rehearsed and te technicalized that they're, om they're, they're live performances, but they're practically not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the only thing that we have in our lives that which is really live expression is sports. That's the only thing. Well, I mean, no one knows at the end of the ninth inning what's going to happen, or even the players. So I wanted, uh, I knew that technologically it was possible to make live cinema, meaning uh, not just live television. Live television uh, works differently than what I call like live cinema. Live cinema has, is shot based. It's montages. This shot cuts to this shot, cuts to this shot. In live television, you have a scene and you're shooting coverage. You're shooting shot to shot, but, but it's not designed to get its impact from the nature of the shots that are being edited together. To do that, you're almost, what we do is almost, live cinema is almost, you have a storyboard and you're shooting a living storyboard going from this setup to this setup to this setup. There, it's different than coverage, as, as you know. Uh, but I didn't know how to do it, and I didn't know what, why I would do it is to try to get the fun of a live performance and the thrill mm -hmm. of doing a live. Imagine saying, okay, guys, three, two, one, go, and then an hour and a half later, you've done this whole thing, and it was like a play in that it was performed and you got a performance, but it was presented as cinema, which is shots and editing. Mm -hmm. So I thought, wow, that would be the holy grail, mm -hmm. at least for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I knew, I was smart enough to know I didn't know how to do it, and so I did several create, uh, you know, experimental workshops where I sort of tr tried to see what it would take, and, and, and I learned much, and that's why I put those notes down in that book. Mm -hmm. But I would like to do it for real. I mean, well, I'd like to really make one that way. Well, we'd certainly like to invite you to the Herbert School and to Hofstra to uh, do another workshop. If well, you're workshops, are, it's always exciting. The kids, the kids love it because they know they're in on the ground floor of something. And I'm not saying, you know, now that cinema is basically a digital medium, not a photochemical medium, I'm not saying that live cinema is the way. Live cinema is one of 20 different routes that cinema can take now that it's become basically digital. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's liberated from any kind of physical uh, reality now. It's, it's digital, it's, it's magical, and, uh, and I think there's lots of other things other than live cinema. There's movies made in collaboration between peoples and artists who are not even in the same place, right. as we know. Right. Right. There's, there's movies more influenced from what gaming is, whatever that is. Right. Uh, so that live cinema is just one uh, possibility made possible by this new era. As, as someone who started their creative career who who had that creative spark 
haunting the new, the then new playhouse at Hofstra University, and now you went into this fantastic career as a filmmaker. When you look at all the different storytelling forms and media forms that are out in the world now, and the possibilities for the young people who are walking some of those same halls you walked uh, those years ago, what do you see for them? What do you see about the possibilities? Are you optimistic about filmmaking and storytelling and communication? Oh, optimistic. I mean, as long as there is humanity, there'll be storytelling. And, and uh, obviously, with the, with the uh, technological uh, possibilities, which are, we were only seeing the little bit, bit of it, I mean, to, uh, I would be fascinated to see your students' grandchildren's movies, but I have no idea what they would be like. Uh, but oh, they would be extremely uh, exciting. I mean, they're going to be definite. I mean, there's no limit to to uh, the evolution and uh, opportunities for change and new ways to tell stories and new ways. I mean, in writing alone, if uh, just take the novel, forget the technology, forget the actors, forget the cameras, forget cinema. Just a simple form like the novel, from the first novel, whichever it may have been, Don Quixote or Goethe or somebody, when you think of how much has evolved and changed about how a story is told in a novel, from the use of tenses and uh, uh, point of view, and and uh, you go from, you know, Edith Wharton to to uh, Flaubert, to uh, or from Flaubert to Edith Wharton to James Joyce to Virginia Woolf. I mean, even just with writing, there's so much innovation possible. So imagine if you now multiply at times all of the technological possibilities in terms of presenting stories to people. It's uh, it becomes. Um, but you know, it's funny. Even while that's true, and even like to talk about live cinema is a new way. The truth of the matter is that we all love the movies that were made in the last 110 years so much that in our hearts we almost don't want the form to change because we love what those masters did. You know, when you think of, people say, well, what's the greatest movie ever made? What's the 10 greatest movies ever made? I laugh. I think, ask me what the greatest 500 movies ever made mm. are. I mean, in the silent era alone, there were 30 masterpieces. Kurosawa alone made nine masterpieces. So when you talk about what's the best movie ever made, you got to talk about the best thousand movies ever made. We we have such a rich uh, literature that came from only 110 years that uh, it's almost that we now who have these new tools, it's like we have, I, I make the analogy, it's as though now you have a car that you can make, but it also can fly. Mm -hmm. But we use that tool that can fly, but we keep it on the road because we want it to be like Fellini's film, or we want it to be like, uh, you know, uh, right. Godard's film. Right. We want, we don't want it to fly yet. Yeah. So, let me ask you. Uh, I want to ask you two other questions uh, to, to finish up. And one, I'd I'd like you maybe to, to look into that camera, and talk to students who, like you, are studying. Uh, storytelling now and maybe in the year you know 2080 they might be sitting on a porch like this reflecting on their career what advice would you have for young storytellers young filmmakers based on your wisdom and experience my advice to any artist is to be as personal as you can make make your work out of what makes you unique and 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 and, and try to uh, take the people, your audience or your reader, uh, on a on an adventure uh, in your world, the way you see it the, and the, what you are. Because you know every person is a million to one shot that you even got born, uh, that your father and your mother happened to meet each other, and you happen to emerge, and 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 so uh, you are so one of a kind that for your work to become like everybody else's is too great a sin to commit that you 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 are obligated as this unique individual to let your art come from your most intimate personal part thank you and let me ask you finally um, 
Could you talk a little bit about your Hofstra journey? It's a very special place. There are many young people now starting out there. Um, some memories of your time in the theater. Well, to be very honest, when I went to Hofstra, I was mainly interested in cars and girls. And that's all I really cared about. And I even wanted the car so I could meet a girl. And that was my hope and my wish. And I even, you know, I was a boy scientist as a kid. And I was, because of a bizarre upbringing, I was taken out of school and my family was always moving. And, and after a while, I, I, they put me in the school. I'd be the new kid whose name was Francis. And I would only go to the, um, they wouldn't even pay attention to me because they didn't know who I was. And I would say, oh, I have to go to the shop. I'm doing a special project. And I would go to the theater department because that they needed boys who could work with electricity and lights and stuff. And that's where the girls were. And so as a techie, being the one who put up the lights and did this, I was watched them do the rehearsal. And I said, well, I could do that. But, but uh, so when I went to Hofstra, I, I, it was that mentality of a 17-year-old that I was. You know, I wanted a girlfriend and I wanted a car. And I would do the theater stuff because that seemed to be something I knew how to do and was fun. And got, I got to use uh, my technical ability, uh, which I, I had. And uh, as it was, I'm sorry, it was not any more grandiose than that. <laughs> but but uh, I, I began to you know, love that work and love the wonderful, theater has a wonderful sense of colleagues. You, know, you go all together and you all go have coffee together and you, you, uh, there's a nice feeling. And, I, and in fact, I must say that that experience, that nice community is what I brought when I came and met all these film students uh, years later, people like George Lucas and, 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 and that bunch, Carol Ballard and, and Marty. And, 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 I, and, and the, the auspices I gave was like the drama club at Hofstra. It was, uh, cinema is a much more, you know, guys are alone with their editing machines and theater that's a big bunch of kids. <coughs> I brought the, a little bit of the theater style to the cinema students and, and my, my, my experience as a theater student was a big help to me in film school. Talk, talk a little more about that. How, well, how for one thing I knew something about acting. Mm -hmm. You know most people go into film uh, directing uh, uh, know a lot about this and that camera. Austin Wells said you can learn all that in a weekend but they don't know a lot about acting and, and, and the key ingredients of cinema is writing and acting. <coughs> so you could know about writing or you could appreciate writing or you could be a writer but most know very little about acting and that's why tr statistically actors become have a higher rate of success to become film directors if you think of all the people who had been assistant directors or writers or cinematographers or editors the category of actor has a far more uh, impressive record of how many did that and how good they were and why because acting is fundamental to cinema even if you're doing documentaries acting is you know how to work with behavior and how to talk to an actor uh, many film directors don't know how, don't know what to say to an actor to, to influence a performance and you learn that by working in theater and by of course being an actor mm -hmm. so so I, I that was a big advantage that I was comfortable with the actors when I was in film school right well I want to thank you for talking to us Francis it's been a pleasure to be here uh, in California with you and I, I hope we'll get to welcome you to the Hofstra well, campus. Well I look forward to coming and seeing you and, and seeing the theater and uh, obviously I love that theater I, I, I slept in it many times <laughs> <coughs> Terrific. Thank you so much. I think that the stage manager's desk that's still there I built. Really? <coughs> I don't know. I don't know if they... Um, we'll have to put a plaque on it if that's the case. Well, it, 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 it was, I think it's the one I built. Wow. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank Okey you, everybody. Dokey. Okay. I want to say hi to all the students at the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication and my good wishes to, to you and uh, to your work and also to... Uh, happy birthday, Lawrence Herbert himself, so happy birthday to you, sir.